Granny is a game that took over the horror scene in late 2017, being played by the same kinds of people you'd see watching Subway servers and GTA 5 racing videos today. Baby back, ay, couple racks, ay. Couple Grammys on him, couple flags, ay. <clears throat> Kids. But besides that point, it actually is a pretty good game series. It may not look like it, but if you look past the surface, which is why I'd assume you clicked on this video, you can tell that there's a lot of care put into this franchise. Despite the most recent installment in the series being three years ago, there's still a large following around it with no downward trend. There's still a large amount of people being excited for the next installment, although I can guarantee that most of said people don't know about the past installments, because Granny has been around longer than 2017. In fact, the series started before Titans like Alien Isolation, Subnautica, and even Five Nights at Freddy's. With a release date of November 4th, 2017, Slendrina started the story that eventually became Granny. So let's pull out our iPhone 5S or our Samsung Galaxy S4 and get into Granny's house. I don't wanna stay. I just wanna go home. I don't wanna now is when I would pull out my iPhone 5S, but I don't have one of those, so I'm gonna be playing on Bluestacks, which is where all the footage will be from. Oh god, this really is from 2013. So the first level starts us in the warehouse, where we're tasked with finding six items to open the door. These items are keys, and Slendrina chases you around, which we should get into her design now since we're gonna see her for the rest of the levels too. Although we can't see much of her before her unwrapped face texture covers the screen, we can see that in this version of the game she is super low detailed, having a solid white dress and solid black hair with no texture whatsoever. This first level, and pretty much all the levels after, definitely show their age. They all look like proof of concept Roblox levels. After you get all six keys, you can go back to a place where you came from and you get a screen saying, Congratulations, you found all the items and managed to keep your eyes from Slendrina. It also plays this god-awful annoying victory sound that hurt my ears for every time you beat a level. Wow! My ears! That is probably the scariest part of the entire game. Level 2 puts us in a hotel where we have to find 6 fuses to repair the elevator we came from. We don't really get any backstory as to why we are in these locations, but it's a mobile game from 2013, so we can't really expect that. This level is where I actually realized that Slendrina's AI makes it so she can only spawn behind you, so if you never turn around at any of the levels, you're guaranteed to never see her, although some of the level design forces you to turn around since you're searching for the items. This level is pretty boring, and this game in general is, but the next game shows us a massive improvement, so we won't be here for long. The next level has us in a forest taking after her father, Slenderman, or presumably. We can't guarantee that the forest is inspired by Slenderman, but the series quite literally started as a Slenderman fan fiction, so it's our best bet. In this level, we have to find six items and then the gate will open. These items have nothing to do with the gate opening. The first one I found was a painting of Buddha, and the second was a picture of a four-leaf clover. And then just other random stuff and magically the gate opens. And finally, we come to the last level, which puts us in a swamp, and this one actually makes more sense than the rest of the levels, telling you that your car broke down and you need to find six items to repair it. This level actually seemed to be very glitchy with Slendrina, having me die randomly without even looking at her. Throughout the level, you can find a tire, a car battery, your car key, which is in the middle of the forest for some reason, a spark plug, a gasoline canister, and a steering wheel on a tree branch. While it doesn't make sense why these car parts would be scattered around a swamp, at least you actually have to collect items that have to do with the car. And that's Slendrina 1. It's pretty subpar. You can definitely tell that developer wasn't very experienced, and you can tell that the game was made in 2013, but it's not the worst thing in the world. Feels like one of those crappy games you'd play on a Discord call with your friends. Hello? Have, have you heard of Granny? Yes. They made Granny... woke. Ah! The next game in the series is Slendrina Asylum, being released on July 5th, 2015. This game only has one level, but it's a major increase in quality from the first game. First of all, Slendrina's AI has been slightly improved, but her design has been changed a lot. Now she actually has texture to her, appearing to be a ghostly woman with a wedding dress, and she looks covered in dirt like she was just dug up from her grave. In the gameplay for this one, you enter an abandoned asylum with the ambient of heavy breathing and a baby crying. You have to find all of Slendrina's eight pages <clears throat> and escape in time. However, some of the pages are locked behind doors that need keys you can find. You open the doors that you can and collect a few keys and pages when the ambient breathing starts getting louder. You look outside the door and... 
What the? Collect my grandma. Hell no! Collect my grandma. That was Sandrina's mom. Making her first appearance in this game, she has gray hair, a wedding dress similar to her daughter's, cloudy eyes that somehow don't blind her, a crooked jaw as if it's broken and she couldn't be bothered to fix it, and arms that say stiff by her sides like they haven't been moved in years. She'll be important when we get to the granny games, and also just important in general. She makes various appearances throughout the series. It is very impressive that back in 2015, developer was able to make a freely roaming AI that is actually just decently challenging to face. Most games as of recent are just scripted sequences for everything. After learning the breathing I was hearing was an actual enemy in the map, I decided to investigate the crying sound and it led me to a room in the middle of the map where there was a picture of Sandrina and a picture of her mom. Wheelchairs lined up next to the wall and a baby in the middle of the room. This baby had the face of Slendrina, but we couldn't see much more as it was wrapped up in a blanket. This baby also didn't shut up for the entire fucking gameplay. By the end of this, I had a terrible headache, but while I was playing it, it wasn't that bad. Now, let's talk about health. In the original Slendrina game, you would die from looking at Slendrina for too long and had no health. In this game, you get a health bar, which could be a byproduct of Slendrina's mom being in the game. She actually attacks you instead of you getting hurt from just looking at her. Usually, Slendrina isn't really a threat, but if you get low enough health, she can be deadly. There are little health potions around the map you can use, so staying alive isn't that difficult. Slendrina can't melee attack you either. I have plenty of clips from my playthrough where I back up against her and can see her arm, but I don't take damage. I actually wasn't able to find out where the last keys were when I got all the pages except for one, so I think the game could have been bugged, but it could also just be a massive skill issue on my part. I ended up coming up with a genius plan, so I'll just show the clip now. Oh, what was that? Oh, she broke down I... a door. Wait, what if I have to get into, like... Break open the- do, do you think I can get her to break open the doors that need keys? Yes. Yes. Come on. Come on. This is definitely not how you're supposed to beat the game. Oh! Oh my god! I'm so smart! I'm actually fucking genius! Okay, come on, come on, come on. Let's go. Hey, you got him, anybody? What's your dumbass? She can't even see me! There you go! After we leave the building, we get the message, Pooh! That was a creepy place. And the baby. Who was it? What was it? Well, I managed to find what I was looking for anyway. Ah, lovely weather. This might just be the worst ending screen in any game ever. Okay, now I should probably mention something. Asylum wasn't the second game in the series. We actually skipped over a couple games. That's because Asylum doesn't have much to talk about compared to these games. So, the games we skipped over were House of Slendrina and Slendrina the Cellar. There's also another game called Slenderman Stands, but that game isn't really important and it's just the first game the developer made. It doesn't contain any info on the Granny slash Slenderina series. But without further ado, let's get into Slendrina the Cellar. So in Slendrina the Cellar, there are... So in Slendrina the Cellar, there are three levels. Cellar 1, 2, and 3. In the first cellar, you start with the task of collecting 8 books. The roof is pretty much scraping against your head as you walk through the hallways. Pretty much every hallway looks the same, so it's very easy to get lost. There are multiple scripted events throughout this level, including Slenderina running across the hallway, a giant Slenderina head on a spider's body gliding down the hallways towards you, the lights going out and heavy breathing down your neck, and many more. These scripted events definitely make the gameplay better, as without them, it'd just be wandering down hallways until you find all of the books and leave. Slenderina herself isn't that much of a threat in this game. Well, unless you're on hard mode, like I was. If you look at her for two seconds, you're dead. In this game, Slenderina has red eyes, meaning this is her actual second redesign, and the Asylum has different designs without eyes. The ending of the level shows Slenderina screaming oh in anger and then flying backwards into the wall, further proving that she is a ghost. And that's one out of three cellars. Moving on to the second cellar, you only get one choice of direction. Well, until you go down the stairs, you get to choose left or right. The location in the cellar is slightly different, having the walls made out of ancient bricks that seem to have no pattern to them whatsoever. The floors are made out of dirt and concrete with the occasional staircase, 
at in depth to the location. Once you get deep enough in the location, multiple staircases down, you can find a little spider quickly crawling on the ground to you. The spider has the head of Slenderina, but once you get close enough, you can see the spider isn't actually spider, instead being a body severed from the waist down. Once the body inevitably catches you, it makes it so you can't move and adjusts itself in front of you, and then launches itself into you. This doesn't actually kill you though, and you can continue. I don't know what this means, or if there's any logic behind it. Maybe it's schizophrenia, because they seem to be adding that to anything these days. You actually see the same body again running down a hallway as another scripted event. If you follow it, you get led to a room with a painting, and walking up to the painting... Oh my god! <laughs> it is impressive how much attention to detail there is in this small game from 2014. There's a lot of level design and little bits of storytelling throughout each level that aren't necessary at all. After beating Cellar 2, you get the same exact cutscene from beating Cellar 1, but this time the wall she goes back through has a hallway next to it. Final Cellar is Cellar number 3, and as soon as you enter, you can see it is very different from the first two. This one appears to be more in an office building, but it's most certainly abandoned. Going behind the desk in the room you start in, makes Slenderina's face appear on the computer. Unlike the other maps, this one seems to have more of a sense of direction to it, having multiple rooms with actual purposes instead of just being senseless hallways. And I'm pretty sure I softlocked myself on the level, either that or I missed the key somewhere. This level doesn't actually have many scripted events because the map is way smaller, but the new level design more than makes up for that. Strangely enough, there's one door in this map that was made out of wood, and after you use a key on it, you get into a place I'd imagine the CEO would be in, holding a clock and two pictures of Slenderina. There's also a shower room with literally nothing in it but another key. And you have to use a key to get in, so there's no purpose to the room at all. Why would there be showers in an office anyway? Speaking of the shower room, when you get the last book and leave the building, it shows the same cutscene for the other endings, but Slenderina is in the showers room this time. And that wraps up Slenderina the cellar. Oh, let me bring Obi back. Sorry about that. What the hell happened? Oh, I guess he took care of that. That leaves me with the House of Slendrina. Now, this game is by far the most important game in the series so far, because this game presents us with an actual full story and answers multiple different questions that have been created so far. When you start the game, you're given the objective of solving the mystery of Slendrina and who she really is. This is the game that introduces Slendrina's mom for the first time. We won't really go over her design though, as it's just a lower quality version of the one from the Asylum. As soon as you get in, you can see a cupboard that needs 8 puzzle pieces to open. These pieces are scattered throughout the house. Walking through one of the doors, you can see somebody looking at you from behind the crack of a door. That is Slendrina's mother. She looks kind of like an egg in this scene, but she has a bigger appearance later. Walking closer, she runs away, and if you follow her, she's nowhere to be seen. Searching for more puzzle pieces, I ended up soft-locking myself by opening a door that locked me against the wall. After restarting the game, I learned that this house is bigger than I thought, having an upstairs and downstairs area. The downstairs area is locked, however, revealed to be the cellar. The key for the cellar is what we get for collecting the puzzle pieces, so let's keep looking. I finally went upstairs, and directly up the stairs and to the left, I was able to see Slendrina's mom's head being on a spider's body. It saw me and then ran away immediately. Spiders are actually a very important aspect of the series for some reason, but we'll touch up more on that later. Going back downstairs, I was able to find a bedroom with a photo of Slendrina's mom on the wall. Going into the closet... Searching further, I found the last puzzle pieces and grabbed the key to the cellar. Going down into it, you get the message, Crowbar Find, which is developer trying to tell you to look for a crowbar, but I don't think English is their first language. When you get to a four-way area, you can see Slendrina watching you from behind a barrel, and she runs away if you get close. Down one of these hallways, I found the crowbar and used it on a door that was wedged shut. In the room, there was a chest in the corner, and I'll just let this scene play out when you open it. Congratulations, you found the answer to the mystery of Slendrina, is the message you get at the ending. But let's talk about what just happened. We picked up a picture of the chest of Slendrina and her parents, her father being Slenderman, 
but this picture portraying them before whatever made them like they are now. This shows Slenderman's face for the first time, albeit not canon to the actual Slenderman lore, and shows Slendrina and her mother being an undamaged family. Our character then sets down the photo and turns around to reveal the damaged family, Slenderman needing to hunch over because of how tall he is, and that's it. Moving on to the child of Slendrina, this takes place after the asylum. In the asylum, there was a baby Slendrina that cried the whole time. That baby has grown now, and is the main enemy of this game. We start off on the floor, a spider crawling past us in a room with a safe, and we search around for a key, letting us out into another cellar. This cellar is small, and kind of like a mix between a basement and the underground section from GM underscore Maze. Oh no, I think we got Chungus down. This cellar, of course, has multiple locked doors around, and keys you can use to open them. But, in the distance, you can hear a DISGUSTING breathing sound and footsteps. I decided not to be a pussy despite what's on my head, and ran into action, discovering none other than a Dachshund of Slendrina. Okay, that one was a bit out of pocket. Discovering none other than Slendrina's child, a little spider guy on the ground way different from its old design. It chases you around for a surprising amount of time, until it eventually loses you. It is near impossible to get through this game without coming in contact with it. If you explore the cellar more, you can even find a mattress which is where it sleeps. But there is a simple way to get it to stop chasing you, and that is a door in the corner of the room that leads to a staircase. This staircase brings you to a house area, meaning that this could be another house that the family of Slendrina owned. In this house, there is no wandering enemy, but every once in a while Slenderman appears, working the same as Slendrina has in the previous games. Also in this area, there's a bedroom you can unlock, showing Slendrina's child in a cradle, and walking up to it you get lunged at but no damage done, like it's FNAF 3. Anyway, the reason we explore this house in the first place is to find a bunch of parts of the safe key. Once we find the last part, we have to go to the safe from the room we started in, and open it, revealing Slendrina's diary. Okay, before we pick this up, I just want to warn in case this triggers motion sickness or something from someone, the screen will be violently shaking for a bit, so go to the timestamp on screen to skip that. Three, two, one. After picking up the diary, Slendrina shakes the entire house and cellar, extremely pissed as the game says, and you have to get to the front door as fast as possible. Running upstairs, Slendrina throws stuff at you in an attempt to stop you from escaping, and as you get to the front door, a giant hallucination of Slendrina's child faces through the wall and tries to grab you before phasing back into the wall. You run to the door and you're free. A note appears on screen of Slendrina's diary, reading, Dear Diary, it has been a good day today, but I'm starting to feel dizzy and nauseous now. The whole family went to the park and the weather was wonderful. Mother was in an extra good mood, which just didn't happen that often. When she came home, she cooked a dinner. I thought it tasted a bit weird, but didn't dare say anything. Mother looked pale and had to lie down straight after dinner. I can hear from the other room. The pain. I feel like the worst out. My head is spinning. This note is very important. It finally gives us insight on what happened to the Sandrina family. While we don't have the full story yet, we can take from this that Sandrina's mom poisoned their family, and was happier than usual when doing so. This note also gives us a year that this story takes place, that being 1892. Specifically, July 10th is when this note was written, but who knows how long it's been since this note was made. Definitely doesn't look like a short amount of time based on the character's designs, but also, Sandrina's child does age through the games, so maybe it wasn't that long ago. That wraps up this game, but it feels like we're actually getting somewhere now. With only four games left until we meet Granny, let's get into Sandrina the School. You enter a school with three stories and a basement. You have to find eight fuses to get the door on the top floor to open. When searching, you can find a teddy bear that you take with you. Slendrina is the only enemy trying to stop you. After collecting the eight fuses, you take them to the basement and put them in the fuse box, opening the door on the top floor. On the wall, there are pictures that either Slendrina or her child drew, being scribbled on paper. After opening the desk in the middle of the room, you put the teddy bear you got earlier into it. Next to the teddy bear appears a school photo, with all the faces blurred out and X's over them, except for one. You got what you needed, so you head downstairs to leave when you reach the bottom of the staircase, and you get pushed over. You slide across the room and you turn around to see Slendrina holding her teddy bear, having just pushed you over. She runs towards you, and you hold up the photo, then, as you set it down, Slendrina is gone. The ending text says that Slendrina spared your life. This could be because you brought her the teddy bear, 
as that seems to make her satisfied in the future games. Now, about the photo, we don't really have any direct confirmation for anything, but we can theorize. I think that the singular unblurred face has to be Slendrina, or else why would we get it at all? This would be another photo of Slendrina before she was poisoned, and while it's possible the X's over the other student's faces could mean something, I don't think that it does. That's it for Slendrina the School. The next game isn't even worth mentioning. Slendrina the Cellar 2 is a massive downgrade from the school. You just go down into another cellar while Slendrina, her mom, and her child chase you. You find 8 books, leave, and then the door gets shut in your face. That's it. Now, these next two games are very important and very good. They expand on the Slendrina family, and the second one is the most important to the series. But let's not get ahead of ourselves and start with the first. Slendrina the Forest starts off with us, believe it or not, in the middle of the forest. We're told that this forest holds a dark secret, and we're given a map of locations to investigate. Randomly wandering around, I found a tent with a generator and a record player inside. There was no fuel, so we couldn't listen to the record player. However, nearby outside, there was a rock with a crowbar sitting on it. Following the map, I went to one of the circled locations and found a key, but at this point, we aren't aware of what the key is used for. We'll hold on to it anyway. I looked at the map again and started heading towards another circled location, this time with some kind of building in the circle. When I got there, I saw Sandrina's mom wandering around and tried to stay out of her way. I went into the building and looked around finding another key in a box I broke open with my crowbar. I picked it up and looked in the next room, seeing Slendrina's mother facing the other way. I quickly turned around and ran away, following my map again. I came up to another building, and entering the front door, there was a vampire standing tall at the end of the hallway. Getting closer to him, he closes the door in your face, but we'll talk more about him later. Going upstairs, I found a box that needed a four-digit code to enter. I don't have this code yet, so I left the building and went to another one. This building had a key underneath an epic Fiverr commission on the floor. And upstairs, there was a coffin that needed seven keys to open. Now we know what these keys are for, so let's look for the rest of them. Leaving the house, I found a gas canister so I could finally fuel that generator from the beginning. On the way to the tent, I found two keys, which means that the final key is most likely in the four-digit box. Turning on the generator and the record player, it played a voice saying the code 5379. So, I went to the box and that code worked to open it. Having all seven keys, I went back to the coffin and opened it, revealing the vampire from before, laying down with his eyes closed. I was then told to leave him be and escape, but I was an idiot and Slendrina's mom killed me before I was able to leave, so I'll just play someone else's footage of the ending cutscene. Sorry it's so low quality. Some of you might already know who this character is, as he's made multiple appearances in other popular media. This character is Nosferatu, or Count Orlok. You're most likely to know him from this. Wait! If that was you on the phone, and you on the bus, then who was flickering the lights? Nosferatu! This character is important in the next game, Slendrina X. So, let's stop wasting time and get into the final Slendrina game. Opening Slendrina X, you're met with the title screen of Nosferatu, his spider, and Slendrina. Nosferatu actually has two pet spiders, and they're really damn annoying. But starting the game, you're in yet another cellar. Locked in a room, you have to find a key to get out, but there isn't a key anywhere. Luckily, you are able to find a loose brick in the wall and pick it up. With no other means of escaping, you slam the brick against the door until it breaks open. Running through the cellar, you find a map and a staircase next to it leading out of the cellar. As you walk up to the staircase, you realize that this isn't just another house or another cellar. This is Nosferatu's castle. With no sense of direction yet, you walk through the castle and find keys laying around. Coming across the spider, he's actually very fast and hard to get away from. Further exploring, you will eventually run into Nosferatu. Now, he's kind of blind and sometimes he doesn't see you, but he works pretty much the exact same as the spiders. This castle is huge and has multiple stories. If you follow a staircase as high as you can, you can find Nosferatu's coffin, which is also his spawn point. Also up here, you can find a chest that requires a specific key. And on the wall, there's swords. Unlike in other games where these would just be decoration, you can actually pick up the swords in this game and fight Nosferatu and his pet spiders. Mm -hmm. 
Nosferatu takes three hits to kill, and his spiders take two hits. This sword pretty much eliminates all challenge from the game. Well, unless you're on mobile, which is where the game is intended to be played. So I guess it isn't that bad. I'm playing a PC port, which will be linked in the description. After wandering around even longer and gathering two keys, you can enter a dining room area and there's another door you go through revealing a cage and Slendrina's mom is chained up inside. It seems like her poisoning the family has finally caught up to her and now she's been locked away by Nosferatu. Picking up the blue key next to her, you leave to open the blue door. But you hear a crashing noise coming from the room you were just in. Going back into the room and surely enough, the cage has been broken and Slendrina's mom is missing. This doesn't make her a Roman character or anything, but we will be seeing more of her later. Anyway, with this blue key, we go ahead and enter the blue door, finding a note in a drawer next to it. The note reads bookshelf, obviously telling you to look for a bookshelf that looks out of place. And once you find it, you pull the book, which gives you access to a crowbar. This crowbar is then used on another door, similar to the one Slendrina's mom was found in, and you find another note on the bed. This note reads, Cellar. They're basically just sending you around the entire map, getting pointless notes that tell you to go to the opposite side of the map over and over again. But luckily, this is the last note. Picking up the note in the cellar, it reads, Piano, A-H-C-A-E-F. There's multiple pianos in the map, so this one is a bit confusing. Searching through, you can find a piano that lets you play the notes. After playing them, a lamp falls over on the piano, revealing a handle. This handle goes to a door in the middle of the map and lets you access the attic area, where you notice you need something to weigh down a pressure plate and some weird puzzle. Luckily, we don't need to do the puzzle, as moving four squares gives you the chest key. We know where to use this chest key, so going back up to Nosferatu's coffin, we open the chest, giving us a rusty anvil. This anvil goes onto the pressure plate from earlier, so running all the way back, we set it down go into the room, and pick up a book. This next part is somewhat hard to explain, but in a final boss battle against Slendrina and her mother, we are put in a white box. Staring at Slendrina makes her face appear darker in the book. We can't stare at her for too long though, or else we will die. After looking away from Slendrina, we get a little break where Slendrina's mom's giant head faces to the wall and tries to get you. Looking at her, however, makes her get shy and phase back away. This gets harder as it goes on, with her mom appearing more frequently, but we didn't come here for nothing. Slendrina appears in one last ditch effort to kill you, but you've been through this long enough. Slendrina is sucked into the book Goosebumps style. You slowly close the book, examining it and dropping it. Finally, the entrance key lays on the ground in front of you. You pick it up and the house starts shaking again. You may have captured Slendrina, but her mother is still free. You need to escape, so you run as fast as you can downstairs, heading towards the next staircase. But, heading towards the next staircase, a giant head of Slendrina's mom starts sliding down the hall trying to kill you. There's only one way to go, so you turn back around and run, getting to the end of the hallway before seeing yet another head of Slendrina's mom. Luckily, there's a door behind you, so you run through it, coming up to another staircase. You take the staircase down, now on the second floor. Going the only direction you can, you see another head, so you turn as it chases you, bringing you to the main staircase. Finally, you've made it to the exit. You run as fast as you can to the door and escape. With no plans of ever coming back, and Slendrina captured, you end up wondering. You may have captured Slendrina, but you've also opened up a new mystery of Slendrina's family. Where did Slenderman go? What about her mom? And where's Nosferatu? And now finally, after 10 games, we've made it to Granny. The reason you clicked on this video. The story of Slendrina is over, but her family still thrives. Okay, now stick with me for a minute because the quality of the games is about to get a lot worse and will remain that way for a few versions. We're going to be starting from Granny version 1 and going over major changes as we go through updates. Granny version 1 is very bare bones and probably isn't the version you remember. This version of the game contains the upstairs and downstairs areas, but that's it. There's not even side quests like getting the crossbow or rooms you can only enter by crouching. This will, however, lay out the foundation for the game, so let's get into the design, character, and gameplay of Granny. 
Granny version 1 is a mobile exclusive and was only ported to PC after the game started getting popular. You start in a 2D pre-rendered menu of Granny's house, with her standing in the doorway to the kitchen. Starting the game, you're met with a screen saying, Day 1, and a cutscene of you getting out of bed. This is because in the game you get 5 lives and each life counts as a day. Every time you die, you progress on to the next day, and if you don't win by the 5th day... To win this game, you have to collect all of the keys to the door, which usually consists of a padlock key, a hammer, cutting pliers you use on a wire downstairs and a wire on the door itself, and a master key you use on the door's handle. In this version of the game, there's only one other item other than the vase that you don't use on the door, and that is a safe key that you can use in the basement. So speaking of the basement, let's go over the house itself. The top floor is where you spawn, in a spare bedroom. Next to the bedroom, there's a bathroom where literally everything is covered in blood. Actually, there's a lot of specific details in this house that indicate another person was a victim before us, but we'll go over that later. On the other side of the bedroom, there's another bedroom, with a closet connecting to yet another bedroom. If you leave through the third bedroom, you'll realize that this entire upstairs area has a nice little balcony down to the main entrance. In the main entrance, there's a little string trap that rings a bell whenever you step on it, letting Granny know where you are. Also in this room is a door under the staircase that doesn't really matter for now, and a door to the basement. Moving on, there's a kitchen near the stairs with a questionable fridge and a microwave that sometimes has an item in it, a dining room connected to the living room with an actual TV, and a room that is literally empty only having a chair and a couple containers. So that brings us to the basement. Being weirdly detailed, having a blood stain on the floor next to a drain, a prison cage door, a bench with some barrels, some wood crates around, and a safe that contains an item you need to get to escape. Now, since Granny's followed me down here, let's talk about her design. She has a misshapen head with some hair, but she's mostly balding. She wears a long gown and wields a baseball bat with blood on it. Her mouth stays open, her teeth disgusting yellow mixed with blood, looking almost like rusted metal. And sadly, under all that dress, she has no legs. Granny also throws down bear traps occasionally, and since the house is so small, they pretty much immediately end your game. Since the house is probably as ancient as Granny, the floors creak sometimes when you step on them, but always creak in the same place. Granny will rush to the location you're in if she hears you creak a floor, so you gotta be careful where you step. Beating the game gives you a cutscene of Granny standing in her doorway, watching you run away, and then it says, the end. Now, let's skip a couple versions so we have something to talk about. The following changes are a result of both 1.1 and 1.2. The house is now bigger, introducing a secret area you can find through the closet in the upstairs bedrooms. This leads to multiple staircases, a secret hole to hide in, and a secret path to the basement, making Granny have to loop the map repeatedly if you drop an item on either side. Also inside this area is a little box you can unlock, giving you a defense mechanism against Granny. If you find the weapon key, you get a crossbow that can knock Granny out for a different amount of time, depending on difficulty. And don't worry, we'll also go over difficulty later. Anyway, while Granny is knocked out, you have free reign of the house, and she cannot get you, obviously. Also with this crowbar, you can knock over a screwdriver in the staircase on a shelf and this screwdriver also goes down to the secret area, unlocking a panel at the bottom of it near the basement. Now, let's talk about the other new area, that being the attic. This is another staircase up from the upstairs area, and in it, you can find a loose floor that you can knock down, as well as a boarded off area. Breaking open these boards with a hammer, you see an empty room, but you can use the planks to build a little bridge across the floor that fell earlier. This adds a new use to the cutting pliers, as inside of the jail cell, there's a fan you need to disable to get one of your key items. Now, remember when I said you only have 5 days to beat the game? Well, also added in these updates are painting pieces that allow you to piece together a puzzle in the basement to give you an extra day. If you're a speedrunner and you're unlocking the main door too fast, Granny puts a code lock on the door to slow you down. This is triggered after getting all the keys to unlock the door. Now, I don't think this has any implications lore-wise, but I could be wrong. If it does, it would mean that Granny is a fair player and actually wants you to escape. But that's something for other people to solve, unless I decide to make a lore video on Granny. Oh, also, Granny was given legs in 1.2, so that's cool. That's all the new features, so let's skip a couple versions, and now we're covering versions 1.3 and 1.4. Now going into Granny's basement, you'll find an extra room behind two boxes. In this room, there's a note that was left by the previous victim of Granny. We will come back to this, but all we need to know for now is that she hides keys and fruits. There's another tunnel in this room, and going out through it, you'll end up in a shed outside. This shed holds blueprints of a guillotine, and sometimes extra items on the shelves. 
Exiting the shed, we realize that we are in Granny's backyard, where we can see another string trap and the guillotine and the blueprints. Also in the backyard, there's a playhouse and a well. Everything in the backyard requires specific items to operate. The well needs a crank, and when you pull it up, you can get another key. The playhouse needs a specific playhouse key, and inside there's another puzzle that requires two cogwheels to open, giving you another key. And finally, the guillotine requires a watermelon you can find in the house, and the watermelon holds a key. Now, inside the basement as well, behind the staircase, there's another staircase down, leading to Granny's garage. Don't ask me why there's a garage underneath Granny's basement or how that works at all because I have no idea. Inside this garage, there's a crafting bench where you can make a SHOTGUN?! Also, inside the garage, there's a sauna that you can lock Granny inside and knock her out if you turn it on. If you don't turn it on, she breaks the sauna open, which makes it so you can't trap her in there again. There's also a car in the middle of the room, but it doesn't matter too much yet, only holding a key inside the trunk that you open with a car key. Also, there's another ending now, so let's talk about that. In the secret passageway, and that's crawl space, there's a hidden button that you press that unlocks a wall, and pushing it out of the way, there's a teddy bear. This teddy bear may look familiar, and that's because it's the same one from Sandrina the School. Picking up this teddy bear, your heart starts rapidly beating, and Granny is alerted to your location immediately. Her eyes turn solid red, and she's faster. If you knock out Granny, you can bring that teddy bear up to the attic, where there's now a cradle in the once empty room behind the planks. And throwing the teddy bear inside... And this is how you get the special ending. Now, after that, which is most likely just an easter egg, but maybe canonically a memory of Slendrina, you escape normally and unlock an ending cutscene where Granny sits on the steps next to the teddy bear, and Slendrina is behind her. That wraps up versions 1.3 and 1.4, so let's move on to the next two versions. Finally, this is when Granny released on PC, so we no longer have to deal with this crappy scuffed Bluestacks footage. Okay, before we get into any of the new stuff, I just gotta say that to play this version of Granny, even though I own the game on Steam, I had to pirate it so that I could get an older version. That is why Granny has a Christmas hat. The first thing you'll notice is how much darker it is. This is because for the PC release, Granny had a massive graphical overhaul, making the game look way better, darker, and in turn, scarier. There's two new rooms to these updates, but that's kind of out of the way, so it's hard to explain them. The first room is inside of the third bedroom upstairs, and you have to knock over a painting which gives you access to a lever. Flipping the lever makes a bookshelf in the room move, and behind it, there's a pedestal for a book. If you find the book, you can place it and the wall moves backwards, revealing Slendrina's mom being chained up in Granny's house. On the walls, there are also photos from Slendrina X. It seems that after she escaped Nosferatu's castle, Granny took over capturing Slendrina's mom, or Granny's daughter. The other room is upstairs in the attic. There's a special key you can find and use to reveal yet another staircase above the attic which leads to a room with a spider's cage, a plate, and a cupboard on the other side. You can either shoot the spider in the cage with a shotgun, trap it by shooting the target next to its cage with a crossbow, or place meat to distract it while you run across the room. Funny enough, this meat is actually a reused model from one of developers old cancelled games, which was a Minecraft clone that looked like this. There's a new nightmare difficulty, which changes the game entirely, but we'll go over that when we talk about difficulties at the end. That door that was under the staircase before, now is locked, and you can unlock it using a remote. Inside, you can usually find pepper spray, which is a weapon that can be used against Granny. It makes Granny unable to see, so she can only follow sound. And now, finally, there is a new way to escape Granny's house. If you go back down to the garage, you can see that Granny's car can now take parts into it. Around the house, you can find an engine part, a wrench, a car battery, spark plug, and a gasoline canister. Using all of these, you can fix Granny's car, but also need to use a padlock key to open her garage door. Now, when you open it, you will see a brick wall, but that won't stop you. Starting the car, you drive backwards and forwards repeatedly until you thrust forward one more time and crash through the brick wall, which gives you a new escape. These next versions we'll be talking about are some of the biggest updates, and the last updates as of recording this video. So, let's get into the final Granny updates. The first edition is going back into the secret room in the closet. You can go down each staircase except one, and into the room with the hanging meat, there is now a secret room behind it. This room is the old house. It has a dining room, a closet, a kitchen, and another closet. The kitchen area has Granny's pet bird, and a food tray to distract it, similar to Granny's pet spider. You have to find bird food to feed it though, instead of meat. Also connected to this area is a sewer, which could have been a past basement to this location. This place has a locked door connected to it that can be opened by shooting a target through a little hole in the wall. 
going into this room, you can find a freeze trap, which is another weapon that can be used against Granny. Using it makes her freeze solid, and then you can push her over and she breaks into pieces. Also in this room is a skeleton. This room could have possibly been used as a jail cell for the previous victim, and that skeleton could be his corpse. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. We'll talk about the previous victim at the end of the updates, so let's keep moving. Granny's car has been changed, so now it's a newer model. Most of the updates between 1.7 and 1.8 were bug fixes, so good job developer. And now we're on to the last update, 1.8, where you explore the first floor of the house, you may notice a trap door on the floor of the living room, requiring a spider key to enter. Once you find the spider key and come back, you can open it and drop down. You can get an item in this little crawl space, but the real action happens when you drop down again. You're met with a tunnel and water up to your chin, spiders crawling on the walls and you push forwards. There's a place to enter, so going through, you're met with a maze. This maze isn't very complicated, don't worry. But explore for too long and you'll hear a scream behind you, one that sounds very familiar. And that is Spider Mom. Slendrina's mother is back again, and also a spider again. Items can spawn in the hiding spots in the tunnel, but the main area is a little hiding hole containing a giant pipe. There's also another pipe in this room that you can use a screwdriver on to find a new item. The giant pipe in this room takes a rusty padlock key, chain cutter, and wooden stick to open. Once you've gotten all of those, you can open the pipe and walk out, giving you a cutscene of Granny and Spider Mom looking back at each other and then out the tunnel, realizing you've escaped. And that covers every Granny update since the first version was released. A lot of these updates were released after Granny 2, and even 3 were released as well. Granny will most likely keep getting updates even after this video drops. But now that we've covered all the updates, let's talk about the hidden story behind this location. All of the blood around the house, the secret messages, and the body from the previous victim. As soon as you get into Granny, you can see that there's a message carved into the table next to your bed that says 5 days. The bedroom next to the one you spawn in has blood on one of the pillows, so that room is suspected to be the room that the previous victim started in. It also wouldn't make sense for them to start in the other bedroom because of Slendrina's mom being in it. There's also quite a bit of evidence to show that something happened in the bathroom with the previous victim, because the sinks, toilet, and bath are covered in blood. And not just stains either, there's actual blood in these that has just been sitting there for who knows how long. There's streaks of blood next to the bath like they tried to claw their way out of it, and the mirror is shattered. Downstairs in the dining room, there's a bloody handprint on the window, and the window has been pushed out, which is usually how people get to the backyard while playing. But, it might have been that the victim broke the window and that's why you can get out through it. They might have broken the window just to see that the backyard is fenced off. Also outside on the shed, you can't see it normally, but if you use cheats to go out of bounds, the word HELP is spelled in large red letters on top of the shed. Granny's bat has blood on it when you first see it, so that could also be from the victim. There's a message in one of the drawers saying, leave this house, and tally marks on the wall of the closet, counting the days until Granny kills him. Now, let's go back to that one note we saw earlier in the room made of dirt, the one that said Granny hides keys and fruits. These were the victim's last words, the last note they made. It reads, this is my fifth day in this house. She chases me wherever I go. I'm quite injured and my body hurts. The only thing I remember before I woke up in this house is I was driving when my car suddenly broke down. I went out to see what the problem was when someone suddenly hit me in the head. I have managed to open a pair of locks on the front door, but that's all. Why does she do this? I hope no one will experience the same thing as I do. If I do not survive this and someone finds this message, I have noticed that she sometimes hides things inside of roots. And this victim is estimated to have died the exact same way as the first death cutscene in the game, because there's a pool of blood in the middle of the basement leading towards the drain. Although, another way they could have died is by being locked in the jail cell and forced to starve to death as there's a skeleton down there. Now, there's only one last thing to cover on Granny 1, and that is the difficulties, which make a huge difference in the game. Now, the boring stuff. Practice mode gets rid of Granny entirely, but the Spider, Spider Mom, and Fall Damage can still kill you. Easy mode gets rid of the floors creaking and makes Granny and Spider Mom extremely slow, so it's hard for them to follow you. Granny gets knocked out for a long time if you knock her out. Granny also has bad eyesight. Normal mode has creaking floors, and Granny gets knocked out for a shorter amount of time. There's a new lock on the door, that being the number lock, which is opened by a piece of paper with a code on it. Hard mode makes Granny and Spider Mom go faster, but still slightly slower than the player. Knocking Granny out doesn't do a whole lot, mostly only knocking her out for 30 seconds. There's also now a battery lock on the door, requiring a battery to open. And the last standard difficulty, Extreme Mode, 
Granny and Spider-Mom are now faster than you. There's iron bars covering the basement hiding spot. Creaking floors can't be avoided. Granny is only knocked out for 15 seconds. And there's a new lock. That being the switch lock that requires you to open a box outside with a screwdriver and flip a switch. You also aren't allowed to get an extra bonus day. Still with me? Good. Now we get to talk about the cool difficulty. That being Nightmare Mode. This isn't a standard difficulty. Instead, it's a checkbox on the menu screen. Once you enable it, you'll notice differences immediately. The walls are now blood red. Everything is covered in a squishy jelly-like blood. The footsteps even are squishy sounds. The music is creepier with a terrifying ambient and there's ghostly rats that run around the house. These rats work the exact same way as creaking floors, alerting granny to you, except they move around the house and sometimes they can move into you without you doing anything. They also cover your screen in blood whenever you step on them. Granny has a new look in nightmare mode, looking almost like she's made of concrete and charcoal. She's unaffected by tranquilizer darts as they just bounce right off her and she's pretty much unstoppable unless you have pepper spray. Can't see. <laughs> Every time Granny drops a bear trap, it's now fleshy and alive, looking like a new Plants vs. Zombies character. There's really annoying chase music while Granny chases you that just gets louder and louder until you can't even hear yourself think. And that is the end of Granny 1. But we still have a few more games to talk about, so let's return to our roots and wake up in Granny's cellar for Granny Chapter 2. We wake up in Granny's basement this time, and exploring around shows us a spike trap, a place for a wheel, a staircase down, and a staircase up. Let's start with going down. At the bottom of the staircase, we can find a boat that we need various items to start up, similar to the car, even needing some of the same parts as the car. If you jump into the water, you're met with a new monster, having three large tentacles, teeth, and an eye in the middle. It's really strange looking, so it's kind of hard to describe. This monster also appears in another part of the game, but we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Also, its eye is the same eye from the scary maze game, so that's awesome. Going up the stairs, the first thing you'll see is the front door, armed with a brand new set of locks. First thing you need to unlock is the cage door, which is controlled by a wheel downstairs in the basement. Then, there's an electricity trap you can unarm by cutting a wire upstairs behind a painting with cutting pliers. Then, you use a padlock key to unlock the padlock, and put a door handle on the front door and you're free to go. Okay, maybe it isn't that simple. The house is actually pretty big and has a lot going for it. So let's go over the rooms. The living room is right next to the front door with your average American couch and television, a grandfather clock, and a new photo of Granny and Slendrina together. About now is when you'll first run into Grandpa. He's completely bald with white eyes, old stained clothes you might see on the average Californian living on the street wielding a walking stick that kind of looks like a crowbar with the way it's colored, having blood on the end of it like Granny's bat. His hearing isn't as good as Granny's, but he can still hear super loud things and Granny dying. The next room is kind of like a hallway, having a doorway to the bathroom, the backyard, and a loop back around to the first room. It has a bookshelf where you can pull one of the books to reveal a tiny hiding spot with a weapon box that has a double barrel shotgun in it. But you need a weapon key to open it. There's also a piano to play some lo-fi hip-hop radio for Granny to beat you over the head with a baseball bat to. <laughs> now let's explore the backyard. It's one of those weird army rooms from old Call of Duty-esque war games. Going into it, there's a crank that's locked with a screw. This crank is connected to a moat, and if you release it, then a wooden board stops water from going across. On the other side of this moat is a cage holding Slendrina's child. Yep. Slendrina's child is back once again, and it behaves exactly like the spider from the previous game. You can feed it meat to distract it, shoot it with a shotgun, or a taser to instantly kill it. Killing it alerts Grandpa and Granny to you, making them have red eyes like when you pick up Teddy in Granny 1. It'll also make a floating head of Slendrina appear above it, staring at you and screaming, which could be what alerts Granny and Grandpa. It is unknown if this is the canon ending for the child, because it doesn't appear in any other games after this. Let's move on and go upstairs, where the first room you'll see is the kitchen, which in all my playthroughs has had the meat spawn in it that you feed to Sundrina's child, so I don't know if that's a coincidence or just how it works. There's a radio on the counter, and turning it on... Moving forward, there's a dining room and a security room. The key to the security room can be found on Grandpa's neck, so you have to knock him out to get the key. Opening the door, we get a camera system that can actually be turned on and operated, and a ladder to go up again. 
We'll come back to that ladder soon, but let's just explore the rest of this floor for now. There's a bedroom, and in the corner of it, you can drop down to the bathroom on the previous floor. And also, there's a staircase you can unlock that goes down there as well. Next to the bedroom, there's a balcony, but the outside is boarded off using wood painted blue to simulate an outside. Going up the ladder, there's a room that has half of it caged off, and you can open the cage by shooting at a target on the other side. There's a box that's chained up, and when you take the chains off, Nosferatu falls out similar to how Slendrina's mom fell in Granny 1. Also up here, there's a door that can be opened using pieces of a picture of Grandpa. Once they're all put together, you can go through, and there's targets you need to shoot using your shotgun. Shooting them opens yet another door, and this one requires a glass fuse. If you don't have the glass fuse, you fall through the floor and end up in the kitchen. Going back with the glass fuse, you put it in and you can pass and find out you're on the roof and Granny has a fucking helicopter. Yes, there is seriously an ending in this game where you escape using a helicopter. The items you need are gasoline to fuel it, duct tape to fix the rotor blade and that actually works for some reason, a helicopter key, and a manual. However, you can actually drive the helicopter without it. If you start the helicopter and try to fly away without the manual, then your character doesn't know how to fly it and ends up crashing it right back where he tried to start it. If you do have the manual, then you can start the helicopter and fly away. Now, we already talked about the boat, but it's the only inning we haven't explained yet. So, returning back to the beginning, the boat needs gasoline, a padlock key to unlock a box next to it, and pull up the gate in front of the boat, the boat key, the steering wheel, and a spark plug. This cutscene shows the water monster, Granny, and Grandpa watching you drive away. There actually are different cutscenes if you play in practice mode, which are really cool. If you leave using the boat in practice mode, the water monster waves goodbye to you while you leave. And if you leave through the front door in practice mode, you get a cutscene of Granny and Grandpa getting home to see their front door open. Speaking of different modes, let's quickly go over the nightmare mode changes for this game. This nightmare mode is way more disturbing, appearing way bloodier, with the same footstep sounds from the first game. Granny's appearance is different this time, and they remove the charcoal from her face so she's completely concrete. Grandpa looks relatively the same, this time he's just covered in blood and overall looks more red and Slendrina's child is the same, but maybe even more red than Grandpa is. There's spiders that run around the house, but they don't do anything. Their pathing is super weird though, and sometimes you can glitch them out, so that's pretty funny. That pretty much covers Granny too, but there's one thing I can show you. Now, before we get into the final Granny game, that being Granny 3, we have to go over one more game that was released by developer right after Granny 2, that not as many people know about. So without further ado, let's get into the twins. Okay, this game is weird. It strays from Granny quite a bit, but also keeps the same foundations. At the very start, we're revealed to be a mastermind criminal, and we're tasked with stealing valuable items that the twins stole previously, so we can return them. Then we'll be free to go. The twins names are Bob and Buck, and they're hiding in an abandoned prison they broke into. Selecting no to this offer gets us put in jail and closes the game. Selecting yes starts the game, and now we're put onto a roof with a crowbar. We break into a window on the roof and land onto a chandelier. Strangely enough, there's a wooden plank leading to an area that gets us down without fall damage, and this puts us in the entrance area where there are two pillars holding metallic recreations of Bob and Buck's heads, signifying that they've lived in this prison for a while now. This place is huge, so we're gonna go over the rooms in a strange way, but we'll get through them, trust me. The first room we'll check out is the cells, which is the main attraction of the prison. Some cells are closed and can be opened using one of the two levers on the top or bottom floor. There are 16 total cells and items can spawn in a lot of them. One of them is boarded off and that one usually has an item in it. On the top floor, there's a secret hole that connects three of the cells together that Bob and Buck can't reach you in. This is a good place to throw dynamite at them from. Oh, yeah, there's tons of dynamite in this game, and it's a really good early defense mechanism against the twins. Eventually, you'll find all the parts to the revolver, though, which will most likely replace the dynamite in your run, as the ammo is common and it's overpowered. Continuing to explore, there's a room next to the hiding hole that needs two door handles to open, but we'll come back to that later. Going downstairs twice leads you to a hallway flooded with water, and at the end of it, there's a cage. If you get caught by one of the twins, you can possibly be put into this cage, and you have to ring the bell to get one of them to come to you. 
and then you can steal the key from his belt. In the downstairs prison area, there's a secret room that you can access with a button, leading you to an area that needs a cogwheel. If you put the cogwheel in, you can activate a button on the other side that gives you an item. Also down here is a hallway leading to the outside. There's a hole that goes to the blueprint room, where you can make the gun, and a shed in the corner. This shed gives you a plank when you break into it that can be useful later. Going into the shed, you can go down into a hole. This hole leads to the power switch. If you turn the power off, Bob and Buck have a harder time seeing you, and one of the electricity locked doors gets unlocked. There's a timer for how long the power is out though, until it automatically turns back on. Now, let's head to the electricity locked door. This is upstairs, next to a bathroom with nothing special. If you go into the locked door, however, there's a hole in the corner of the room that leads you to a path of planks above the main entrance. If you grab that plank from earlier, you can place it at the end of these and open a box with a screwdriver that has the Mona Lisa in it, and that is one of the valuable items. Let's head back though and go upstairs again. This leads to two doorways, the first being a strange room with what looks like spare mattresses on the floor, and a door to an office room. This room has a safe, and the code is on a wall randomly throughout the building. Also in this room is a switch that you can activate using a key. If you flip the switch, a platform falls down from the roof that has a diamond on it, being another valuable item. If you go through the hole in the wall in this office, you can get into the twins' closet. There's a carpet that can be moved, and underneath you put in a code that moves a painting in the bedroom, which is on the other side of the closet doors. In practice mode in this room, you can see Grandpa sleeping on the bed, and there's no way to wake him up. Trust me, I tried. After beating the game in practice mode, you get a cutscene of grandpa standing where the twins would usually stand. Now, let's talk about the room that needed two handles. If you go into the room, you can see a box, and inside there's a PLASMA GUN! This thing holds compressed gas, which you can get from the upstairs area in the main room, and it shoots giant explosive bullets. Now that we're equipped, it's time to head down to the trap door in the middle of the entrance. There's a strange parkour down here, with moving platforms, and since the gravity in this game is so fucking devastating, you're pretty much forced to wait for each of them instead of jumping to them. At the bottom of this pit, there's a giant beetle, being the pet of Bob and Buck. This beetle guards the area, but you can kill it with a few different ways. We didn't bring this plasma gun down here for nothing, it's the first way to kill it. Then, you can use dynamite, or shoot it multiple times with the revolver. You can also trap it, but that's boring and he doesn't die. Okay, now that we've gone over all the important rooms, let's talk about the endings. The main ending, escaping through the front door by getting a red key and an iron disc and then leaving with all three items, has Bob and Buck standing right outside seeing you've escaped, and Buck hits Bob in the back of the head. The rooftop ending has you open a little panel on the top floor and access an exit door with a green key, showing Bob and Buck looking down a ladder, and Buck tases Bob, throwing him down from the roof! And the last ending has you breaking a brick wall in the flooded hallway, and then using a blue key on the door and leaving. Bob and Buck watch you leave, and Bob is safe this time. Since I forgot to mention it, in these hallways you can find a hand wheel to access a coin in the blueprint room, and that is the third valuable item. Okay, now that we're finished with the endings, there's one last thing worth mentioning, and that starts on the menu screen. There's an option that says, with guests, and turning it on activates Granny and Grandpa alongside Bob and Buck making the game way harder as there are now four enemies. You can also find a Sundrina mask in this mode, and it works like FNAF 2, making it so the enemies think you are Sundrina so they won't fight you. Finally, the twins is over. No hate to the people that like it, of course, I'm just not the biggest fan of it. And after all this time, we can talk about the final game in the series as of me writing this script, Granny 3. This is my favorite game of this franchise. It's perfect. It's quirky and silly and sometimes extremely broken, but all of those in the best ways possible. The puzzles of this game are better than all of the other games, so how about we change our format here for a minute and explain the game as intended, then go over everything we missed afterwards. You're at this house for a reason. You aren't being kidnapped, you aren't stranded in a forest. You came here on purpose and know what you're getting into. You see Granny's new house. A mansion, bigger than all the other houses. Granny's destroyed front car on the lawn, and there's a moat surrounding the house. The gate closes behind you, locking itself. There's no going back now. You have to cross a bridge to get to the damn yard. And you walk forward. You walk up to the front door, but something feels off. You turn around and see a familiar face. Grandpa, with the same double barrel shotgun you had in the last game. With no reason to hesitate, he shoots you right then and there and you fall to the floor. Miraculously, you're alive, and the idiot that threw you in the cage left a lockpick right next to the door. So let's get out of here and take a look around.
There's a few doors down here and a giant hole in the wall, but we'll come back to that. Heading upstairs, you see the entrance, the staircase, and realize that you have access to the entire outside area of this game. Let's look through more of the first floor though and move forward to the kitchen. Desperately searching drawers for something Granny could have left, you find a weapon key. The weapon you get in this game is by far the best weapon in the entire series, if you can aim. Outside, you can find little rocks on the floor and you can hold three of them. These rocks are used as ammo for the slingshot, which is the weapon you get from using the weapon key. If you aim for the head and hit Granny or Grandpa, it'll instantly knock them out. Missing their head and hitting their body just makes them dizzy and stand still for a minute. Also outside, there's another guillotine that you use with a fruit, because that wasn't just a one-time thing for Granny, apparently. And yes, a coconut is actually a fruit. Turning to your right, you see a shed that's locked, and we'll be back there later. It is required to open for both endings. Okay, let's address the elephant in the room before we head upstairs. This weapon you get does have an unfortunate side effect of being so good. It's overpowered, and you can kill Granny and Grandpa so easily that once you get the weapon, even extreme mode is manageable. A lot of the weapons in these games suffer from that consequence though, especially the crossbow in Granny 1. With that out of the way, let's go upstairs. Up here, there's a bedroom, a piano, and a hallway that leads to a bathroom, dining room, and a kind of living room with a fireplace. This fireplace allows you to place a log and matches, then go up to the roof and grab a key from the bird's nest. If you didn't put the log in matches, the bird wouldn't let you grab the key, very much like Granny 1 with the bird cage and bird food. The dining room has a little elevator thing that also leads down to the kitchen and up to a room we'll talk about soon. The bathroom has a safe that you can open with the safe key, and you'll pretty much never go into that room for any reason except that. Heading upstairs to the third floor, there's another bedroom, a spiral staircase to the roof, and a little box that controls the gate being opened, but requires a fuse and for the power to be turned on, which you can turn on in the shed outside. There's a broken floor up here, and you can get a plank that allows you to go across, but to get to the other half of the room, you need to go to the roof. On the roof, there's a hole that you can go into to find Slendrina's cradle, and some other items probably. If you give Slendrina the teddy bear, she gives you an item in this version, and then disappears so you don't have to deal with her again. Which I didn't mention, but she does appear and divert your attention sometimes in this game. And now finally that hole in the wall in the basement. If you head in, you can see a little box that you can use a coin on to get a ticket. What's that ticket for? The giant fucking train station underneath Granny's house. This place actually has quite a bit to go over, so let's start with... What? What the hell? Okay, this guy grabs your ticket from you and makes this a loud noise if you don't have a ticket. His design is reminiscent of an old game that developer made called Robot Hunt, where you need to fight robots. It was released during the Slendrina games, but isn't important to the lore and it's just a silly little robot shooter. Giving the robot the ticket allows you to access the train. To activate the train in the middle of the room, you need to flip three levers in a box, but you also are required to find a lever for this box, as there are only two present. After that, you need a train key and an accelerator and then you are out of Granny's house. But we still have a lot to go over, so let's back this train up. Also down here, there's a little store. Opening the door rings a bell that lets Granny know where you are if Bart here hasn't yet. Mason Troy Adams. Sometimes an item spawns in the back, but other than that, it does have a tunnel leading to the front of the station, which is pretty useful to juke out Granny in the beginning. And now the only room we haven't really shown off yet is the shed, which just has a generator to turn on the power with a wire and a cover that sometimes holds keys or useful items. We're getting really close to the end here, so how about we don't beat around the bush any longer? To escape through the front gate that you came in from, you need to first turn on the power. Then, assuming you found the fuse, you can go up to the top floor and press a button on that red box from earlier, labeled gate and the camera feed shows the gate opening as you press it. It's close to being that easy, but not quite, because you also need to find a bridge crank that you can use right next to the bridge, and then you are free to escape out of the open gate. Okay, and the difficulties in this game are pretty much the same as the other ones, but a notable change is since Grandpa has a shotgun now, he can aim and shoot way faster and harder difficulties, and of course, nightmare mode. This nightmare mode is very similar to Granny 2's, as it has much more blood. The footsteps are different depending on where you are now, but they all pretty much sound the same. The rats are back from Granny 1, and this time there's like 50 of them. There's a new design for a few of the characters now, so I'll go over the main ones and then briefly talk about the other ones. In this version, instead of Granny being made up of concrete or charcoal, she's actually appearing like you would expect in nightmare mode. She's pretty much the same as she would normally be, except maybe a bit less pale and covered in blood. Grandpa looks pretty much exactly the same as in Granny 2, but maybe they turned up the contrast or down the brightness on him. Okay, this is kind of stupid, but I actually forgot to talk about an entire new character in Granny 3. 
that being a minor one but still an addition. Granny now owns a pet crocodile that resides in the moat surrounding her house. He's very silly and you can never get a good look at him since he just becomes unsubmerged when you walk in the water. Anyway, here's what he looks like in nightmare mode. Somewhat different, but not anything big. And next, the crow has a redesign in this game for some reason. Here's them side by side with the normal version. And here's what the robot looks like in nightmare mode side by side with his normal look. That would cover all of the nightmare mode changes, and that would also cover all of Granny 3 as well. Granny 3 was an amazing game. It was unbalanced, but no matter how many placers I did or how good I got at it, every time was still fun to play through. In my personal opinion, I think it's the best game by developers so far, but I believe that they're probably only going to get better and better, and with a giant community following, Granny has a bright future. There's already been extremely notable fan projects like Granny 4 and Granny Remake that shows extreme amounts of potential, especially the latter, which will get its own video soon enough. Sandrina as a series has its moments. The story is promising, but the gameplay in most of the games is lackluster at best. I still enjoy the locations and all of the characters, and I will definitely be keeping up with developer. Hell, I can almost guarantee that this won't be my last time talking about their games. I can't wait for the story of these games, no matter how many scuffed moments it has, to be expanded upon and for us to get more answers. So thank you for sticking with me through this whole video. I know it's been long, so I've got one last section for you before the video ends. I live inside my own world of make-believe Kids screaming in the cradles, profanities I see the world through ice covered in ink and bleach Cross out the ones who heard my cries and watched me weep I love that I didn't taste good at you. I didn't notice anything. I can hear me in the room. The pain. It's hard to I had it spinning. I went out to see what the problem was when someone suddenly hit me in the head. Why did she do this? I don't know one will experience things as I do. Thank you all for watching. On the left side of the screen are all kinds of people that contributed to this video, whether that be through a mod they've made, footage I've used, or anything in between. I'd like to give a special thank you to Sybildis and Afton, good friends of mine who joined my channel. If you want a verbal thank you, go ahead and join my channel. Sorry this video took so long to get out. Hopefully the next one can be released sooner. This script was 50 pages long, so I really hope this does well. Either way, I'll see you guys next time. I've been Ulti. Peace. But I get oh, hold on. <laughs> <laughs>